So I wanted to start out uh, first by correcting something I said last week. Uh, I had used the word when I was sharing, I used the word depression instead of uh, the more biblical term of discouragement. So I think, uh, um, so depression is more of, I've learned that depression is more of a uh, clinical or medical word, and a better word I should have used is discouragement because the Bible emphasizes us to encourage each other because that's the fight. That's the, what we use. Encouragement fights discouragement. Um, that's a so that's I want to stick to that word discouragement. That's a much better um, way uh, thing to to stick to the word, the word of encouragement and discouragement. So. Um, Today I wanted to talk about one one temptation that can sometimes come up to discourage us, that can come in, and that's the, the temptation that we must work for our salvation. We're living in a day where the the truth about the fact that we're saved by faith and not by our works is well known, but it's still very easy to live in such a way that we can act or feel, or in our heart, feel like we need to work to, to uh, for our salvation. The reasoning goes something like, I'm not spiritual enough yet, I'm not mature enough yet, God's not happy with me, um, I'm failing all over, I gotta work now so that God, God won't be angry with me, that type of uh, that type of thing. And in our heart we can feel like that and it can drive us to fear and anxiousness. So um, Paul, if you want to turn to Galatians 3, he spoke to the Galatians about a similar temptation. And I'll just read verses 1 through 3. The Galatians, they had been given the truth that we're justified by faith alone in God because Jesus did the work for us. But um, they started to fall back from that and started to live um, not with that in their heart. And so Paul wrote to them, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? Having begun by the Spirit, are, now, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Am I leaning on my flesh now to try to perfect my performance, my um, willpower, my efforts, and I trying to win God's favor by working in the flesh. Uh, so the Galatians started out in the spirit with faith, um, hearing the word of faith that Jesus was crucified for our sins. He's the one who did the work. But the Galatians crept back into the thinking that they have to do so many things in the flesh to remain justified before God. And we can be tempted with that thought too. We can see a lot of other people examples and say, look at these godly people. I'm nowhere near that. I'm so wretched. They're so spiritual. Um, they're so much more mature than me. God must be disappointed with me. Uh, but that can, kind of comparison can kill us. And um, Paul goes on to reason in this chapter right here. He said, he talks about the fact that not even the best person is justified by their works. Not even the most godly person we could think of in the world is fit to stand before God on their works alone. And he says in verses 10 and 11, For as many as are the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by, abide by all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. So basically, he's saying the most godly person in the whole world is justified in exactly the same way that we are, by faith. Not because of any performance that we've done. Some great um, Olympians win gold medals on their own efforts, but we don't. We win our gold medal on the work based on the works of Jesus. Um, and so that's encouraging for us that we could say, God sees me just as if he sees the, just as he sees the most godly person on earth. And not only that, but he sees me just as if he, if he sees my righteousness, just as he sees Jesus righteousness. And that's my foundation for my life. So I can rest in the fact that I don't have to work to please God. I'll work because I love him and I'm going to work because I want to say thank you to him, but I'm not working because I need to win his favor or impress him uh, anymore. And if we fall into the trap of thinking that we need to work for our salvation, we're going to be so discouraged and the Christian life will be basically living under the log. And God's word is so clear. Uh, stop working for your salvation. Jesus, you already have it in Jesus. Um, Luke 12, 32. Don't be afraid, little flock, for your father has gladly chosen to give you the kingdom. 
Luke 10, 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. They're already recorded in heaven. We don't have to work so that they'll be recorded in heaven. I sometimes think of it like similar to a, a, a test that we're going to be graded on. So imagine a, uh, a PhD student who works years and years and studies so hard um, for, to get, gain some degree. And, but let's say that um, they're at the end of the, the PhD uh, education that there was one test that he got one shot at to take. And if he passed it, then he gets... All, all of his work was um, worthwhile and he gets the um, the grade, he gets the, the degree, he gets the PhD, but if he fails, then he loses everything and he can't take it over and all of that work and those years were useless. Uh, imagine that kind of, um, that kind of uh, weight that would be on a person. Um, well, uh, that's basically what life was before Jesus. Um, you get one shot and this is it. But Jesus, he came in and he said, I'm going to take this test for Bobby. Um, and Jesus took the test and of course he got the perfect score. And he said, okay, you already have an A now, Bobby. You still have to take the test. Just do the best you can. Um, work hard, do the best you can, but you have an A. Uh, that's what Jesus did for us. He passed the test, the test that we can never take over again, the, the test which will determines our eternal destiny. He took it for us, and we're, he's already given us an A. Praise God for what he did. That He's still saying, you still have to take the test, um, but just do your best now. The weight is off of you. You don't have to work for the A. You already have it, but do your best, um, and remember what I did for you. And so I praise God that um, I, for year, it ha hasn't been years since I feared my eternal salvation because of Jesus. I just I know God's love for me, and I know what Jesus did, and I'm secure in His sacrifice. And so I praise God that He's given us the that guarantee that His work is completed, and His work is my work because He chose to give it to me. Um, if we for all of us who believe in Jesus, why why don't we work have to work for our salvations? Because Jesus did it for us. He won our salvation for us. It was his sacrifice. He sacrificed himself um, through his death. We receive the benefits. And so, um, as I think about Jesus' sacrifice for me and what I gain because of his sacrifice, uh, I've one of the I wanted to share just one of the most stirring pictures that I've ever seen of sacrifice that I made me think of this. And um, if we could just bring it up on the projector, I saw this a little while back uh, on the internet. And this is a picture of uh, a PhD student who, uh, that's the father and the son. And so they were, uh, this was a poor farmer who um, grew up in poverty and he, uh, apparently his, his wife died and he was, had to raise his uh, kids on his own. And he worked day in and day out as a farmer working so hard uh, to pay so his son could have an education. And so uh, basically the picture I see here is his, the, the father gave up his life for, so his son could stand there uh, with a PhD and have a future and a hope ahead of him. So uh, I, when I look at this, I say, that's me on the left and that's Jesus on the right. Like basically he has no, like this guy, he has, uh, his body is broken. He was like, there's no uh, possible uh, way that he put his hope above his sons. His son was standing there with a hope and a future in front of him. And so to me, this says, um, this is me. I got full of life with hope and a future because Jesus was mangled basically for me. Um, and so I wanted to read Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. He said, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. So by this, by this father's uh, sacrifice, he's, his body is mangled, he's dirty. Uh, for the last probably 30 years, he's uh, just been dirty every day, day in, day out, working uh, blood, sweat, and tears, but uh, he has his son now, and he has a, there's another picture, actually, um, of these two, and he actually, the father has a smile on his face, like holding his son, so it was, it was a joyful sacrifice that he did, he was happy that his son now has a future, um, 
And so I see that, uh, I keep that picture in mind. That this is Jesus, uh, God the Father gave Jesus up to be mangled for me so I can stand there with my uh, cap and gown. And um, I praise God for, uh, for that. It helps just keep in my heart what Jesus did for me. Um, treating his life, his own life as disposable so I could uh, have one forever. <clears throat> So we don't need to fear losing our salvation. What Jesus, what God sacrificed so much for, he's not going to give us up easily. Uh, he bought us with a very, very high price, and so he's, uh, he's holding on to us. If we don't leave him, he won't leave us. We don't need to think that because we're struggling in our performance or our, um, uh, our spiritual or mature life or our maturity that we're going to, uh, now God's going to forsake us. He's not going to forsake us. Um, he who, Romans 8, 32 and 34, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also free, with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So Jesus is saying he intercedes for us. So he completed the work and Jesus is still working for us. It's like this, this man in the picture, I noticed one thing on the bottom of the picture, his feet are still dirty. That means he's still probably working to pay off this boy's college. Uh, even today, like he, he's still like, I'm gonna keep laboring for my son even though he already has the PhD. And this is what Jesus is doing for me. He's interceding for us. Even today, he's still working for us. Um, if we've drifted from the Lord, we could say, Lord, I'm sorry for drifting. I want to get back on course, but help me to do better. But I praise you that your blood covers all of my failings and all of my, all of, every time that I um, stumble, you cover me. Your blood covers me. Thank you, Lord. I don't need to work for my, for my salvation, but instead let me work to, because I love you and because I want to say thank you to you. Um, you've freely given me all things uh, in, in Christ. Praise God. <clears throat>